today, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite pieces of neuroscience history. This is a situation where um, there was a famous neurophysiologist named John Eccles, and he had a very particular, uh, he, had a, he had a particular idea about how neurons communicate with each other, how synapses, these connections between neurons work in the brain. Um, and it turned out that the idea that he had ended up being wrong. And he actually, uh, at the end, won a Nobel Prize by proving his own idea wrong with an experiment that he had set up to try to uh, demonstrate, in fact, that his idea was correct. So um, this, this uh, story is actually chronicled in uh, a sort of memoir that he wrote um, uh, about 40 years ago now, um, in which he talked about um, how he went from believing that synaptic connections have electrical, prim or primarily function through electrical contacts between neurons, to believe instead that synaptic connections are chemical, and, and neurons f uh, communicate by releasing chemicals primarily. Um, so the question that really drove him with this is that he wanted to understand how inhibition was possible with neurons um, if they are functioning through electrical communication. Uh, it's prior to this particular experiment, he knew and many people accepted that it was very, very possible for the electrical activation, the positive voltage changes in one neuron to if that neuron has an electrical connection to a second neuron to lead to a positive voltage change and what we call excitation um, of the receiving cell. But um, one thing that he and others who believed in the idea of electrical communication struggled with was how to explain inhibition. When one neuron becomes active, another neuron receiving uh, an inverse negative signal from it can happen if communication is electrical. And he struggled with this idea for a while. Um, and this is problematic because it was well known for many, many years prior to when he did this experiment that there is such a thing as inhibition. So um, one place where this was very well documented was in uh, um, sensory reflexes in the spinal cord, was in reflexes in the spinal cord. Um, we know that when certain sensory inputs are stimulated, um, that will cause the activation and excitation of some motor neurons in the spinal cord, um, but also causes inhibition and decrease in activity in other motor neurons. So for example, if I touch a hot stove, then I want to contract some muscles to pull away, but I don't want to contract all of my muscles or my hand just sort of freezes on that stove. I want to relax the muscles that I had used to go down on that stove and contract the other muscles to get away from it. And so this, this inhibition, this relaxing of those other muscles is really the, the issue that he struggled with. Um, and so he came up with, um, in the middle of the night, kind of like Otto Lowy, he came up with this, what he thought was going to be like the, the, the saving idea behind this, um, which is that um, there might be some sort of cyclical current flow. Um, and the physics behind his idea turns out to not be very important for our story because he ended up being wrong. But he did come up with a convoluted but conceivable way that electrical only connections might result in one neuron becoming active and then another neuron being inhibited. Um, and so what he set out to do was look for cyclic current flow. And again, be, um, we're gonna skip over the physics of, of the idea here, but we know already, we know already that when we stimulate our input, if we record from one of these motor neurons, we know we're gonna see a big downward voltage, hyperpolarization, the neuron's gonna become inhibited. But he thought, well, maybe if we look closely enough, 
what we might see as evidence for this cyclic current flow is actually when we stimulate, first we'll see a little blip up and then this big inhibition. And again, because of the physics of his sort of convoluted idea for how you could get inhibition with electrical only connections, he thought that this would be what would be observed. The other thing which he did not expect was, in, was that when you stimulate the input, you might not see that little blip, you might only see the inhibition. And so he thought people hadn't looked closely enough in order to see the little blip, which would be indicative of this cyclic electron flow, cyclic current flow, and then that would indicate how an electrical only set of connections could inhib, could lead to inhibition. And then on um, early morning on the 20th of August, 1951, he went into lab and did the experiment that he designed. So here, this is the action potential in the presynaptic cell that he's stimulating. And then down here, this is the response, the inhibitory response. And importantly, there's no little blip. He averaged across many, 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 many recordings looking for any evidence of this little blip and saw absolutely none. Um, he also looked at some excitatory inputs as well as the inhibitory inputs and saw um, uh, none of these little blips that he expected based on his models for how electrical connections work. And so this led him to the conclusion that he was wrong and that, in fact, there is no evidence to support the idea of electrical uh, synapses and inhibition. And if neurons are communicating, he's, he's led to the sort of inescapable conclusion that inhibition is for sure chemical. And if inhibition is chemical, then he figured that it would probably be the primary mode by which neurons communicate for inhibition and excitation and everything else that they do to communicate with each other, which it turns out is true. Um, now, in fact, there is um, some evidence that there are a small number of electrical connections, all of them are excitatory, um, in, the, in the brain, um, which we know about now as well. 